In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have, this afternoon, two selections from the Gospel of Luke. The proper gospel is the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist, and the other that we read together in lieu of a psalm is the Benedictus, or the Song of Zechariah. Zechariah has been serving as a chief priest in the temple and was confronted at the altar by the angel Gabriel. When told that his elderly wife Elizabeth would have a child, a son no less, his reply was, <laughs> no, 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 no. And for that, the angel sealed his mouth, and he was unable to speak until after the child was born. Sure enough, out comes baby John. And when Zechariah goes to insist that his name is John, his mouth is opened. And he sings. The hymn will come to occupy a central place in the prayer of the church in that it is one of the hymns that is always sung at the office of Lodz. And it would, ta- it would occupy a central place in Christian worship for millennia. In his song, Zechariah praises God for fulfilling all of the things foretold in Scripture for a mighty Savior, like from the Malachi passage. Zechariah also calls something strange in the specific context. He tells his son that he will be a prophet of the Most High. It was the consensus among the various factions of Judaism, and both in Judea and in the Diaspora, that the days of prophets were over. God no longer spoke except through the words of the Torah and the prophets. God still guided the cosmos, but the law was eternal. The days of prophecy, which is, by the way, not foretelling the future, but rather speaking the word of God directly when enraptured in the spirit, was over. This is the long predicted and longed for consummation of the prophet of Abraham. And John is the forerunner to a greater figure. The dawn is breaking and salvation is at hand. And so the neat intellectual consensuses of religious people were freely ignorable by God. So skipping over the infancy narratives and Jesus in the temple, we meet the adult John in the gospel passage. He is proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The opening of the passage, however, is rather clear in giving the specific context. There is no Israel except as the assembled people of God. There is no sovereignty. The, uh, he is an itinerant preacher, a Nazarite, as described in the book of Leviticus, wandering around proclaiming that a new day is coming. Indeed, a king is coming. All of that, make straight, raise up, lower down, that's about making a royal road, because a king is coming. The complication for this is that there are a great many people in charge in Palestine at the time. We have the Emperor Tiberius and his lieutenant, Pontius Pilate, who is in who governs Judea directly on behalf of the emperor. We then have Herod Antipas, who's a tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip, also a tetrarch and ethnarch, it governs two other little areas. And uh, the fourth brother, and notice I say fourth, governs an area called Abilene, which when I was Texas caused a great, mon- a great amount of confusion for, for some of the kids in church every couple of years. They were like, Abilene? Um, but there are no kings here. 
Tetrarch is sort of a sovereign prince, like the Grimaldis in Monaco. Uh, after the death of Herod the Great, none of his sons were allowed to claim the title king. They were simply princes who ruled on behalf of the emperor. There is no sovereignty here, per se. There is allowed authority, neatly circumscribed. Now, the three brothers were allowed to off brother number four so they could expand their territories, but that was just considered a bookkeeping issue. It wasn't really polit. It wasn't, you know, don't take it personal. It's only politics, and you know, it's easier for three instead of four. And um, finally, and least important in the subject matter, we have Ananias and his son Caiaphas, who are exchanging the high priesthood. Uh, they will also play a role later on in the story. John, by proclaiming this royal road, is threatening the authority of all seven of these men. If a sovereign lord who rules by his own authority is on his way in the name of God, every one of them, from far distant Tiberius and Rome, to the priests in Jerusalem were eh, being a little pre were, were, were being confronted by something. And the prophetic voice, the voice in which John is talking, is almost always a dangerous one. Very seldom does God send a prophet to say, everything's fine, carry on as you were, just wanted to tell you everything's a-okay. The coming of a great new king is an unsettling announcement. The implication of the declaration of the coming of a new kingdom of God indicates that at least one, if not all, of the sovereignties indicated are facing the end of their time. Zechariah's hymn ends with how our feet will be guided, quote, into the way of peace. Jesus will tell us, however, that his peace isn't like the world gives. Rather, to borrow from Zechariah, it is tied to the ability to serve God without fear. This would end up with John being led in the paths of peace all the way to beheading. We are nowhere in any of the Gospels promised anything like an easy ride. Signs of success in our world, wealth, luxury, endless large portions, perfectly straight and white teeth, hot and cold running servants, all these things are, however, looked upon askance in the Gospels. We are not called to success, we are called to be faithful. To be guided in the paths of peace is not to be satisfied in sitting in a quietistic, passive, pink, fluffy cloud. Rather, it is to take up our cross and to walk in righteousness all of our days. Zechariah is proclaiming freedom from both oppression so that we will from both oppression and comfort, so that we will be free to face and to worship our God and to serve our God. Just like last week, where we were supposed to be aware of the moments where we can actually act in line with the coming and present kingdom of heaven. So this week we discover that we are set free to walk in the path of peace to do that. That the peace we are promised is not pass passivity, prosperity, nor even propriety. Should not bother us. It is not a strict, formal, political solution. Rather, it is the peace of Christ to do what we are called to do in the moment. It is to serve the true home of Christians, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. I use these words quite deliberately. If God is Lord and Christ is our king, that means that they are owed our ultimate loyalty. 
not our nation, not our party, not our various ideologies. It is Christ, not any uh, worldly thing that we are called to serve. We who are the called out are to follow Christ in the path of peace. That leads us to service, not to power for its own sake. It is to risk or possibly invite rejection and danger. The path of peace is not Candyland. It's more like Axis and Allies. Lots of fiddly bits, no one's sure what's going on, then bam, it's done. And you're not always completely sure who won. In all seriousness, the path of peace is uphill. That said, just to name figures from the 20th century, Dorothy Day, Catherine Doherty, Oscar Romero, and Teresa Lasseau are all examples of people who lived in peace while engaged in struggle. The forms of society chained to, by sin to the emptiness of excess and hate will push back often with great force. To quote another great figure of the 20th century, our Archbishop Helder Camero, Cam, Cameru, my, my Portuguese isn't that great, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why they are poor, they call me a communist. Our own feelings of sinfulness can also hold us back, particularly when other people point them out. Remember that we are rescued from that which binds us, and we turn to our liberator again and again as we wait for the great dawn to break upon us at the, on the last great day. We must labor on, despite opposition or discomfort. Amen.